Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, and how Samuel was, came to David's house and was looking through the, to find the perfect king for the people. So please join me as we read in unison. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah come pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then seven of his sons passed before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's time. So I have a question in the scripture passage. Oh, the, the scripture passage that we just read, uh, Samuel was sent to, to this family because God told him that there was going to, amongst all of these children, all these sons, one of them was going to be made the, the king. If you think of somebody who's going to lead you, right, be your leader, what would you, what what? I would say yourself. Yourself. Okay. Uh, that's great. And Owen. What? That looks like a solid thing. It's not though. It's just a hand covered in mud. That goes with the next in the in the next scripture passage. There's a story that we're going to read. You're going to be in Sunday school. Jesus um, uh, spits actually in the mud in 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 some dirt and makes the mud and heals somebody with it. So that's why I chose that. That does that make sense? Okay, but it's not. So if you were to choose a leader, tell me the characteristics of that person. Isa. Brave. Cool. Subjective. I mean, what does that mean? But yeah, cool. Yes. Smart. Smart. What else? Strong. Strong. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Sam? Jack. Caring. caring. I was, that's why in my head I was thinking, I'm, I hope they say kind. Yeah, caring, kind. Anything else, Sam? 
Strong, brave, intelligent, caring. Anything else? Kind. Kind, yep. Anything else? Or are we good? Mindful? What, what do you mean by that? Mindful of other people? Yeah, I, I like that. Not just always thinking about himself or herself, right? So what's really interesting about this, this scripture passage is God tells Samuel, you know, it's not the outward of appearance of a person that's important. It's what's inside the person, who they are. And all the things that you listed were about how a person is, not necessarily what, what the person looked like. But then it's so funny because then, then the writer goes, now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. So they, I, why they had to put that in there um, is it kind of contradicts what was said before. But it's how we are in the world, right, is way more important than, than this, right? And when I say this, I mean it's, you know, what we look like. And we put and in the world, we put a lot of value on what people look like. But really how you are, being mindful of other people, being kind, being, you know, being generous, being brave, all of that stuff is way more important. Doesn't that make you, isn't that good? Yeah, right? Now, I, I also thought of, you know, uh, asking you, like, what is one thing that, that you like about yourself? Do you have any of those? Brave, kind, intelligent, curious, I would say, for you, sir. What were you going to say? Curious. curious, yes. Jack? Kind. Kind. Sam? Fast. Fast. Excellent. Issa? What, what, um, what is one thing that you think that you exhibit that's good, like, that would make for a good leader? Um, slow. Caring. Yep. Slow. slow? Sometimes slow and steady wins the race, right? Being th- thinking before you act? That's not a bad thing. All right. Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Okay. So we're going to pray, and I'll pray for us, and then you're going to go out to Sunday school. Gracious God, uh, thank you for um, seeing what's inside of us and for teaching us what is valuable. Help us to be good and brave and kind and smart and uh, loving and all of the things that make for good leaders in this world. Uh, And help us when we see it in other people to thank them, to lift them up. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I will see you later. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John. It, John is a storyteller, and this is a long story. But it's good. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It it is he. Others were saying, No, but it must be someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. 
Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform, perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then, how then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind. They said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God, God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you were trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do, who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Anyone with any kind of difference finds in this passage liberation and blessing. The disciples ask, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples are asking an age-old question. Scripture does not agree. Scripture argues on this point. And let me say that again. Scripture is not of one voice. The books of the Bible contradict each other on this point. In the book of Exodus, when the commandments were handed down, it says if you worship other idols, then the punishment will go down generation upon generation upon generation. The prophet Ezekiel takes exception to the idea. And he says, no, no. 
everyone's just responsible for themselves. None of this generation upon generation stuff. Everyone is responsible. If you, but you know, if you are a sin, you will get punished. But if your father sins, that's on him. Slightly better news. Jesus rejects the idea that difference is a punishment for sin. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. Now, some would interpret this to mean that the healing of his blindness was somehow how God's works were revealed in him. But those of us with difference know that God's works can be revealed in the blind man, whether he's healed or not, or the deaf person, or the woman with nystagmus and um, I was born with congenital nystagmus, which means my eyes move all the time. Uh, some people assume it's a nervous tick. Some of you may, not, I'm told it's not noticeable, uh, or some people n notice it immediately and other folks don't, but it is how I was knit together in my mother's womb. Whether you are quadriplegic or any of the ways that we other people, imagine being told that your existence is the shame of your family, that you bear in the body, in your own body, the shame of your family, punishment for sin. I think we can imagine it because it still happens today. Jesus walks over to the blind man, and did the blind man overhear these religious types debating about whether you know his blindness was was it his own sin or is his parents sin did jesus feel compelled to walk over to restore his sight and his spirit to restore him to community there's part of me that wishes that he hadn't uh, physically restored his sight and just had blessed him in his difference and says, you know, God can work through you. But in that context, in that time, he would have remained an outsider. And Jesus determines to return him to community. He restores his sight and makes him an apostle. He says, go, you know, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent to be an apostle means to be sent out. It's like he's being baptized, restored, and sent out to testify to his experience of God made known in Jesus Christ. I was blind, and now I see. Which is, I'm really grateful that, that Dave played that at the beginning because we sang that last week in worship, and then I looked at this week's uh, uh, lectionary reading, and I went, darn, it would have been good for this week. I was blind, but now I see. And the resistance that this man gets to his healing is, is astonishing. But again, we shouldn't be surprised. Because we can doubt other people's stories of faith healing. And the resistance, of course, is from the religious types who don't want to believe him because they don't want to believe that Jesus comes from God. Because that would change things. Or they are truly trying to protect the, 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 the church, the integrity of the church. They are, it, it is with righteousness that they are trying to, with righteous intent, however wrongheaded. And I would say lacking humility. Being so sure of themselves. Now, the people hearing the story read in Scripture or reading the story in Scripture, the early Christians, would have resonated profoundly with the blind man who can now see. Because they truly believed that they didn't, they didn't want to start another religion. They truly believed that following Jesus was faithful to, their, to the Jewish tradition and, the Jewish, and that Jesus was a legitimate rabbi, albeit the Messiah, but also you know, following the teachings of 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 their Jewish rabbi, Jesus. And they were driven out of community and had to make church 
They didn't want to start a new religion, but they were driven out. So the first layer of the story is that in, in the story from John is the blind man who worshiped Jesus was driven out of the community faith. The second layer is how the people, their early Christian community were driven out because of their faith in Jesus. Third layer, how do we do that? So sure of ourselves and how God operates and in whom God operates that we have driven people out. One of the commentaries I read, uh, Matthew Meyer Bolton talks of going to Salem, Massachusetts, where the, the Salem witch trials, and he, so he, he was taken by this mural on the wall of a man uh, in Puritan garb, pointing his finger and saying, witch! And he said, but if you sit with the mural, you'll notice that the man's skin has a greenish hue, and some of the features that, you know, that we associate with witches. Who was the sinner back in the day? The supposed witches or the powerful throwing their fear and bigotry at those women and all those who went along in silence? The passage in Ezekiel that I referenced earlier where the one where the prophet says, no, 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 everybody's responsible for themselves, their own sin, he expounds on what is considered sin. If a man is righteous and does what is lawful and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her menstrual period, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not take advance or accrued interest, withholds his hand from iniquity, executes true justice between contending parties, follows my statutes and is careful to observe my ordinances, acting faithfully, such a one is righteous, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. Everyone is convicted by that list. And I really don't want to have to go through it one by one to convince all of us that we're all convicted by that list. So I, if you want to, go home, read it. And if you, if you after reading it, you, go, you want to call me, say, no, Robin, I'm good. Then, you know, we'll do lunch. Let's do lunch. And then we can go, go through the list together. And we can talk about idolatry and justice. It, uh, and I, I'm, comp you know, anyway. I have a joke, but I'm, I'm, yeah, no. Maybe? No. There's something in that list I don't want to know. Now you're going to have to go back to Ezekiel 18 and, and read it again. My junior choir director, Claire Tupper, and I remember this as a kid, she would say, whenever you point your finger, just remember there's at least three pointing back at you. I have not forgotten that. Life is hard, and we need each other, we need God, we need community. I have been celebrating in my heart the ways that I see you care for one another. And when you do, I, I think, this is church. This is church. This is doing church right. Life is harder for those who are othered, who are excluded, because of, God, of how God created them. And it struck me this week, as actually one of the commentators said it, and he couldn't, he couldn't quote the, the passage from Psalm 139 that I say almost every week. Uh, know that God knit you together in your mother's wombs, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, which totally resonates with somebody who was born with difference. Jesus wants to be in relationship with you. Jesus wants you to be in community with others. Jesus has created a family of faith. And for some folks, you know, who didn't score in, in the family department, we make our families. And Jesus has made for us a family. But we need to put down our fingers and open our arms wide in the name of Jesus. We are all sinners. We are all forgiven. We are all loved. We are all works in progress. Some of us have more work to do than others. 
But as God's will is revealed to us, we will continually find ourselves saying, I was blind, but now I see. May God, in God's gracious mercy, convict us of the ways we have been a stumbling block to others. And may we dedicate ourselves to doing better in Jesus' name. We'll never be perfect, but let's resolve to walk in this world in humility, inviting all to community. And may God bless our efforts, and may the healing begin. In Jesus' name, amen.